Hello and welcome to our NYU Langone Orthopedic Webinar Series, Avoiding Complications in Treatment of Distal Radius Fractures. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tyler and I will be the facilitator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with the few features of this web event technology. On the right side of your screen, you will see the Q&A window. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the send button or press enter. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed throughout and at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our presenters, Omri Ilon, Thomas Graham, Sanjit Kanda, and Tony McLaurin. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our presenters to begin the presentation. Hello and welcome. This is Nadir Proxima, and uh, we have an exciting webinar for you tonight. We're going to be talking about this radius fracture. Our first talk is by Dr. Omri Ailan, Assistant Professor of Orthopedics here at NYU, and he's going to be talking to us about anatomy and avoiding complications of closed treatment of this radius fractures, which is probably what we do most often. Omri, please take it away. Thanks, Dr. Proxima. We'll get my talk up here in a second. <clears throat> so basically, I'm going to be talking about um, like you said, anatomy and um, assessing the radiographs for these injuries. And, you know, we're, we're seeing these injuries pretty much all day long. So um, hopefully I'll provide you guys with some basics and leave you with some pearls that you can use in evaluating and treating these patients. So let's get started. So I have no, uh, no relevant disclosures here. Okay, so I'll be talking about the radiographic anatomy, um, how to get proper x-rays and determining what's acceptable and some tips on avoiding complications and treating these injuries non-operatively. So here's the goal. Other than having a great uh, slogan, <clears throat> slogan on your shirt, this is um, uh, essentially the goal when, when treating patients, whether it's with surgery or without. You know, this patient was treated non-operatively. She had an excellent outcome um, and uh, she had some horrendous looking x-rays, but sometimes that, that, uh, that can have a good outcome anyway. So talking about the distal radius, it's a funny-shaped bone. It's pentagonal in cross-section. Um, it's got a bunch of uh, tubercles and notches and protrusions. And just a couple of things on this slide I'll bring your attention to is the boulder lip at the lunate facet that juts out um, quite, uh, quite substantially. It really acts like the pedestal for forced transmission of the carpus. And we'll be touching on some other aspects um, later on. So how do you get proper x-rays? This sort of sets up treatment for either non-operative or operative management. So I know it seems basic, but I think it's good to, to go over. So um, for getting a PA, and we'll talk about the difference between a PA and an AP later on, but basically the, the shoulder needs to be abducted 90 degrees. And to get a good lateral, you want to make sure that the arm is adducted and tucked in against the body with the owner border of the, of the wrist resting on the plate. And then... When you have a multiply injured patient, sometimes you have to get a little creative with positioning and a good x-ray technician to help you get the, the views that you need. And another thing to, to consider is where your beam is coming from, um, and that will help you determine whether or not you're getting a PA or an AP. So if you're in the OR and you're using a C arm, the source of the image is coming from below, as opposed to when you're in the office and you have more of like a digital x-ray setup that's coming from uh, from above. So the C-arm is coming from below and vice versa. And that will come into play later on. Um, okay, so how to think about uh, the the wrist. I'm talking about the PA's view right now. And so um, uh, Rickley and Regazzoni came up with this column theory that really is helpful in um, thinking about and communicating uh, injuries in the distal radius. And this is true for non-operative and operative management. So we have these three columns. The radial column includes the radial styloid and the scaphoid facet. And then the intermediate column includes the lunate facet and the sigmoid notch, while the <clears throat> ulnar column includes the distal ulna. And each of these columns have their associated ligamentous uh, structures as well. So now let's talk about um, how, to, how, to, uh, how to evaluate critically these, these x-rays. And so... Uh, Medoff described uh, something called the central reference point, which is very handy in determining uh, 
um, the ulnar corner of the radius, which is then used to determine uh, you know, the radial height, the inclination, and the ulnar variance. Um, and so what you do is you look at your, at your PA and you trace out through the dorsal rim of your radius, and you trace out the volar rim of your radius, and then you take sort of the halfway mark, and that's your uh, central reference point that you're then going to be using for, uh, for other determinants uh, down the road. So for example, you have the radial inclination, and I put up the normal values here. Um, I would just remind people to, to get contralateral films routinely when evaluating these injuries. The way you take this is you take a perpendicular line to the radial shaft uh, and align it at the central, re uh, central reference point, and then take the other line to make your angle to the tip of the radial styloid, and this is how you come up with this, with this value. So similarly, to look at uh, the ulnar variance, um, here it's really important to get contralateral films and uh, be aware of the morphology of the ulnar styloid here. You want to make sure that if you're comparing it to the contralateral side that the morphology appears the same because as the forearm rotates, the length of the radius also changes. So you know, when, the, when the forearm is pronated, the radius will, will be shorter and so you'll have a greater uh, ulnar variance. So this point is also taken from the central reference point that we were talking about before. So here's a here's a patient who you know not pretty X-rays um, <clears throat> like we were talking about. This is an elderly woman who had a, a standing level fall insufficiency type fracture, and so this is just showing. There's your central reference point, and then that's how you would measure your ulnar variance. And so at first glance, it may seem like this is underselling it, but you know you'll see the lateral of this patient later on in the talk. Here's the radial height that's not, in my opinion, as useful as the other parameters. However, I'm just showing how to take it. Same thing, uh, uh, perpendicular down the radial shaft to the tip of the uh, radial styloid. Um, and this should be, you know, within a reasonable amount, roughly five millimeters of the other side. So again, the importance of contralateral films. Okay, and here's something that I wanted to touch on, and this is true for when, you know, when, when doing reductions in your office or in the ER. Um, and also for when you're restoring all these parameters in the OR. So coronal shift is, um, is something you should definitely pay attention to. Um, it was, the, it was uh, identified uh, by Fujitani in a study in the hand, in the hand journal that um, a DRUJ gap is the most important predictor of DRUJ instability. And so basically what's happening here is um, the, uh, the relationship of the forearm axis of rotation um, needs to have the relationship restored of the, for the inner osseous membrane um, to have stability, which will then provide DOEJ stability. So just keep an eye out for coronal translation. Okay, so back to you know, the importance of knowing if you're getting an AP or a PA. This is just an anatomy sort of uh, reminder is that uh, make sure you take into account the transverse carpal arch. Um, and so what that means is the carpal bones are narrower on the volar side as, than they are on the dorsal side. So if you know where your beam is coming from, just keep in mind that the beam will have divergence. So um, let me show you here. So this is the same patient, the same wrist. Um, the AP is on the right uh, of your screen and the PA is on the left of your screen. And you can see the appearance of the carpal bones and the gap between them. Uh, like, for example, the, scaph the, scaph the gap between the scaphoid and the lunate. And so it's more accurate to assess um, the gap between carpal bones on an AP given the divergence of the beam and keeping the transverse carpal um, arch in, in mind. The other thing that I'll show you is if you look at the, <clears throat> at the sigmoid notch. Let me see if I can point to this here. Uh, anyway, the sigmoid notch uh, on the PA, um, you're sort of looking right down uh, right down the barrel there because of the, the dorsal obliquity of the sigmoid notch. And granted, there is quite a bit of variation, but it's just something to keep in mind. That's just, you know, the AP is better for assessing carpal instability. Okay, so let's, let's look at the lateral and see what information we can glean from a lateral x-ray. So obviously, first you want to make sure that you're taking a true lateral. And so uh, what you should Keep in mind is that the the lie the distal third of the scaphoid. And so I have that outlined here. And I would also urge you to ignore the, the overlap of the radius and the ulna. It's, it's tempting to just say, oh, the ulna and the radius are overlapping. That's a good lateral. However, um, 
that can mislead you. Like, for example, if there's DRUJ instability in the setting of a wrist fracture, then you can just be focusing on the forearm and ignoring the actual um, carpus. So you really should be a stickler. You should insist on good x-rays. Next structure that I want, to, I want you to focus on is the, the radial styloid. And so <clears throat> um, this is a volar structure, and I, I often have the residents and fellows repeat this out loud in the OR, make them say it five times out loud. Um, and basically, this is a good anatomic landmark, both for when you're reduce when you're you know when you're uh, reducing these fractures in your office or um, in the OR. Um, it's also a good reminder about the relationship between the radial styloid and the biceps tuberosity. Proximal those are generally 180 degrees apart. Okay, so now assessing carpal alignment. Um, there's a few ways to do this. Uh, the simplest way, one of the one of the ways is. Basically, if you take a line down the radial shaft, it should uh, line up with a line down the center of the capitate. Um, another way you can do it is if you look at a line on the volar aspect of the, uh, the cortex of the radius, that should line up with the bisector of the uh, lunate. And that just is another example of the, that volar jut uh, pedestal of the lunate facet. So here's just an example of, of volar translation with an impaction kind of Barton's type fracture. Those lines obviously don't, don't line up. Um, another thing that some of my colleagues will be speaking about I won't touch too much on is, is the carpal alignment. You know, you make sure that you have a good lateral to assess um, carpal instability. <clears throat> um, up to 30% of disarranged fractures can have associated carpal instability, so that's something to, to keep in mind. So you can see here there's a DC type deformity here. The angle you're looking for is you know, greater than 70. You can also notice an adaptive carpal instability with something like a like a malunion, a dorsal malunion of a disturbance that we, we see pretty typically. Okay, so let's talk about um, the lateral, the joint lateral view, which I think is truly indispensable in evaluating these injuries. So basically, <clears throat> what this is based on is the the uh, joint surface of the radius has two separate facets like we talked about, and so they have two separate um, angles that are associated with them. Here's the lunate facet that is more of the load bearing of the wrist, and here's the radial, uh, I'm sorry, the scaphoid facet. So basically we want to be looking right down the lunate facet, and so to do that, you basically have to do what's called a 10 degree lateral or joint line view, which is very simply just elevating the wrist. Um, and this gives us a lot of information about the actual joint surface um, and reconstructing that with um, either surgery or reduction. So here's your regular lateral, the same patient, and this is the 10 or 15 degree elevated view. Um, you, you're, seeing, you're, shoot, you're, you're seeing right down the, the pike of the, uh, the lunate facet. Okay, so <clears throat> focusing on this, on this view, um, I want to talk about the teardrop, which is basically a, a U-shaped rim of lunate facet. Like we talked about, this is that pedestal of the wrist. It's difficult to correct um, malalignment of the teardrop with just a cast. Normal is about 70 degrees, and you can see that if that uh, angle is larger, it sort of uh, implies widening or separation of the joint, and vice versa. That joint, that uh, joint surface will, will tilt dorsally, and the teardrop angle will decrease. Sometimes this can be the only indicator of joint line separation is this uh, elevated lateral view. So I would really urge you guys to get this routinely. Okay, so looking at the parameters on the lateral view, the volar tilt obviously, roughly 11 degrees is normal, although there's a huge range. Like I said, compare to the lateral view. And then here's some, uh, that's how you take it. Here's some basic parameters and, you know, Part of the art of medicine is this determining, you know, which which patients are high demand, which patients are low demand, and, and that's sort of um, one of the themes of my talk that I'll talk that I'll touch on in a bit. All right, so now we know how to uh, how to assess these injuries radiographically. So what's acceptable? And you know, most people who tell you they know you know how to treat you know disarranged fractures 100% of the time, um, they're full of it because we know that there's such you know big variability. So Let's talk about these criteria. 
These are the Lafontaine uh, criteria. Um, basically, dorsal angulation of 20 degrees, dorsal comminution, an associated ulnar fracture. Um, you know, the only validated predictor of these was age greater than 60. And, you know, we also know that the older the patient, the more the deformity is accepted. So, you know, I would, I would take these with a big grain of salt. I'm hoping that's salt. That was like a Google image search. Okay. So here's some treatment guidelines that I, I, I try to stick to. Um, I find this to be pretty helpful. Now, granted, they are just guidelines, and every patient is different. Um, but it sort of uh, gives you an idea about what you should be looking for on those parameters. Um, again, we're treating patients, not x-rays. So every patient is different, and you have to sort of modify your treatment based on the patient in front of you. Like I said, know thy patient. Um, it depends on not only their age and their activity, but also whether or not they can comply with the cast, um, whether they can, you know, uh, follow the treatment guidelines. Here's that patient, 90-year-old patient, insufficiency fracture. Um, it goes against all the guidelines that I just showed up, but she was extremely happy and functional for what she required from her day-to-day -day life. All right, so a little bit about avoiding complications. Um, you know, these are the principles that we learn in our training in residency and fellowship. Um, when you're reducing these injuries, you want to make sure, first of all, that the patient is comfortable. Usually, I perform reductions at the patient's supine, just because I find that the patients are able to relax a little bit better. Um, do a nice hematoma block right into the fracture. And um, one tip about that is it's not a wrist joint uh, injection. It's a hematoma injection, so the needle is going a lot more proximal than you think. Make sure you're hanging weight for a sufficient amount of time. And the three-point bend, you know, the, the old adage of a, a curved cast leads to a straight bone. And so I'm just showing sort of where your, where your molds should be. Um, think about ulnar deviation and avoid maximal wrist, wrist flexion, like the, the cotton loader position that can result in some bad outcomes, including uh, finger stiffness and median nerve compression. So in terms of my sort of Algorithm, I do get weekly x-rays um, after a closed reduction for two to three weeks. Um, it, and that's specifically if I have concern about the reduction holding. Um, or if the reduction was done elsewhere, I just uh, don't trust uh, any other reductions other than my own, which is sort of pig-headed. But, um, and I generally do change to a short-arm cast at two weeks. Now, I, th you know, this was a, a good study that was um, – out of England that showed that routine x-rays uh, after surgery, I'm sorry, after reduction usually, uh, usually are not helpful. Um, however, you shouldn't just blindly uh, follow these. If you have a clinical concern, then I think x-rays are definitely warranted. So all my patients get these in the office to go home with uh, when, when I'm treating non-operatively for distal radius fractures, as well as after surgery. But it just um, reminds you that you know a, a, a still finger can become a stiff finger in any setting. So I just encourage you to uh, remind your patients about uh, the importance of finger motion. So in summary, um, get proper x-rays. Be a stickler about that. Like anything, know the anatomy and treat the patient, not the x-ray in front of you. Make sure that you speak to your patient about what to expect and be vigilant. I think that... Um, treating these injuries can be uh, rewarding, uh, even if we don't go to the OR, which is what we, what we like to do, but um, hopefully you guys were able to get something good out of this. Thank you. Aubrey, thank you. That was an excellent talk, and the uh, majority of fractures are treated non-operatively, so it's good to know all that stuff. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Kanda, and while we're uh, getting the slides up, Dr. Kanda is a uh, Chairman of uh, Orthopedics of the Combined Medicine Orthopedic Program and uh, Assistant Professor of Orthopedics here at NYU. And, um, ah, perfect. And he's going to talk to us about volar plating. Sonny, if you're ready. Thanks, uh, Nadir. So, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Praxima and Dr. Steve Lee, who provided some of the pictures uh, for my talk. I'm going to be talking about avoiding complications in volar plating. Uh, something I think uh, that uh, the majority of us who are operating on distal radius fractures probably use this as uh, kind of the go-to workhorse uh, approach uh, for fracture fixation. So my outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about preoperative planning and things that we can do to avoid complications. I'll go through surgical approach, uh, 
and things that I like to do to avoid complications during this part of the procedure. And then I'll talk about intraoperative reduction techniques, uh, intraoperative fixation, um, and things to do and things not to do to avoid those complications. And then finally, uh, we'll just touch base quickly on postoperative protocols to avoid the more long-term complications. So to get started, so for preoperative planning, so first I like to obtain x-rays of the wrist and the hand. I think it's important to obtain x-rays of the hand, um, not only the injured hand, but potentially even the contralateral hand, because I'm looking for uh, issues related to the carpus. Um, oftentimes, distal radius fractures can have translation of the energy into the carpus and uh, have associated carpal injury. Um, I also uh, am examining uh, the uh, x-rays of the injured wrist to look at the things that Omri talked about, to look at radial inclination, volar tilt, and radial height. Oftentimes, uh, in our distal radius fractures that need surgery, the parameters are very, very uh, skewed, uh, but I do want to compare them to the contralateral side. The other thing I'll point out is that it's important to talk to the patient and figure out that they've never had another injury to their wrist. Oftentimes, in our very elderly population, they may have already had an injury to the wrist that has been re-injured, and the parameters that you're looking at will never look normal. And so that's something that you can run into complications trying to restore something that uh, has not uh, been anatomic for a long time. Now, when we get into uh, reviewing some of our uh, injury films, I do like to focus on looking at the injury films. Uh, don't look at just the uh, post-reduction uh, films because uh, a good reduction can uh, almost obscure the fracture lines because it's very difficult to figure out what's going on. You may think that you need a CT scan uh, to really see what's going on. The reality is is that uh, the injury films are the majority of the time uh, very descriptive and you can see fracture displacement very well and you can see intraarticular extension very well. Uh, for example, in this case, um, if I were to bring my arrow into the field, um, in our splinting x-ray, it looks like there is no fracture. Uh, at best, it looks like maybe there's an extra-articular fracture, something that I can readily treat uh, non-operatively. However, when I look at my injury films, I can see very clearly um, an intra-articular fracture with a very large lunate facet fragment. Um, and as uh, Omri pointed out, this is one of the markers, of intra-articular extension uh, with a lunate facet fragment that it leads to instability. Now, here we go, and again, I think Omri touched on this, so I'll just quickly go over, but the, for preoperative planning purposes, these are the uh, criteria I like to use, which are LaFontaine's criteria, which was first published in 1989. Uh, initial dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees, dorsal comminution, intraarticular radiocarpal fractures, um, associated ulnar fractures, patients greater than 60 years of age, and greater than 10 millimeters of axial shortening. Now, with regards to the surgical approach, uh, the surgical approach I like to use and the workhorse surgical approach is the modified bowler henry approach, also known as the FCR approach. And this takes advantage of constant landmarks that we can usually palpate. Um, if it's not right at the wrist crease, it's usually a little bit more proximal. Uh, if the distal wrist is very swollen, then I do palpate more proximally in order to feel this. Now, this approach avoids dissection around the radial artery and thereby minimizing injury to it. Now, after incising the palmer roof of the FCR sheath, the fascia overlying the FPL can be incised. And I usually take very good care at this step, especially if the wrist is very swollen or especially in high-energy distal radius fractures for two reasons. First, it's quite possible that the initial surgical incision may be too medial. Now, if this happens, you may be directly over the palmaris longus. Incising the underlying fascia will put you directly over the median nerve. And if you're not expecting this, it would be very e easy to, to injure that median nerve. Also, in high-energy fractures, the radial artery and the median nerve can be displaced directly directly under the FCR tendon due to the initial displacement of the fracture. And this can oftentimes disrupt the underlying interstitial tissue holding these important structures in place and where you may be expecting to have an underlying fascia layer that may not be present. So it's very important, um, especially in high energy fractures, to have a very a low threshold, have a careful dissection. Now, as we move along in our surgical approach, um, you know, I am focusing on, uh, you know, using blunt retractors, okay, and I prefer to use Army Nave retractors or Sen type retractors. Um, radially, uh, I usually put another blunt retractor to retract the radial artery, and again, ulnarly, this is helping retracting the median nerve and uh, the FDS and uh, FDP tendons. Now, at this point, I do place one two, uh, one two five K wire into the radiocarpal joint, and this diagram uh, 
they're showing a, an 18 gauge spinal an 18 gauge needle either is acceptable um, but I like to do it in order to define the distal joint line and the volar radial carpal ligaments extend approximately five millimeters uh, proximal to the joint line, and you should not incise or elevate through these ligaments as it puts the carpus at risk for instability. Now, the K wire I place into the joint uh, at this step allows me to make my incision over the pro uh, pronator quadratus as distal as possible without disrupting the, uh, the carpal ligaments. Now, after incising the, uh, the pro uh, pronator quadratus in an L type fashion, um, I do like to keep my retractus in this position right here. Uh, in order to prevent my knife from slipping. So if you can imagine making a transverse incision across the pronator quadratus here, if I have a retractor right here, I'm protecting my radial artery. If I have a retractor right here, I am uh, essentially protecting my median nerve. Moving on to the next step. So I think it's very, very important to visualize both the volar and radial surface uh, during your exposure. Um, this helps to better ensure an anatomic production and not only that, but it can minimize aberrant callus formation on that radial aspect of the wrist um, and, and decrease irritation to the first dorsal compartment. Now, specifically as I'm making uh, my incision and my approach uh, and I'm incising the, the pronator quadratus, I do dissect radially a subperiosteal dissection along the radial styloid. Now, obviously I'm being very careful here to protect my radial artery, but looking at a fracture fragment on two planes allows for better anatomic production. You can get, you can be very easy to be deceived here and think that you're reduced on just the volar surface and you can be off rotationally. Um, and not only that, but this is the area right here where my arrow is pointing, where if you are not anatomically reduced and callus starts to form, it can irritate that first dorsal compartment. Now, obviously before I even uh, make my surgical incision and when I'm examining the patient, uh, I'm examining the patient for um, for median nerve symptoms. Now, if the patient has uh, what I think is acute carpal, carpal tunnel syndrome, median nerve neuropathy uh, due to this injury, I'm planning on doing a carpal tunnel release. Now, for me, it's primarily in high energy injuries. I work at level one trauma center, so we see these relatively routinely. Patients who fall from a ladder, uh, motorcycle accidents, high energy mechanisms, it's much more likely to uh, see a carpal tunnel syndrome. In this scenario, I'm just extending my SCR approach into the carpal tunnel. Um, now, again, pitfalls, be wary of the high energy fractures. There's a much higher incidence of these. Um, realize that when you extend these incisions into the palm, you can certainly have uh, uh, more difficulty closing the wound, especially as the top soft tissues start to swell during the case. If necessary, uh, do a delayed closure. Nothing wrong with that. Just make sure you have a nice sterile technique. Now, as I'm uh, going through my operative checklist, I've made my exposure. Uh, I want to make sure I have an adequate exposure. You know, having a too small of an incision puts uh, undue stress uh, as you're trying to retract. And in this area, you definitely don't want to be retracting too much. If you retract too hard uh, ulnarily, you're going to be retracting on the median nerve and cause a, an iatrogenic median nerve uh, injury. Uh, for retracting too hard radially um, can compress and cause injury to the radial artery. Um, you want to make sure your plate is placed adequately. You want to be placed squarely on the bone. You don't want to be overlying the distal radial ulnar joint. You don't want to be placed too distally or too proximally. In the next few slides, we'll talk about why you don't want to do that. Um, if you're using pegs or screws, you want to be very uh, cautious about the length of those. Um, if you're too, too, uh, too long uh, dorsally, then you cause irritation to the extender tendons. Avoid drill over penetration for the same exact reason. The extensor tendons are sucked down right to the bone. You don't want to uh, drill right through the tendons. Always check the DRUJ stability after you're done with the volar plating. You want to check forearm rotation. Make sure there's no screws that have penetrated into the DRUJ that are going to block forearm rotation. Um, consider additional stabilization. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, if you feel like you've got too much comminution and you've already tried to do a volar plate, you may need to supplement with K-wires, you may need to supplement with uh, additional plate fixation or even an external fixator. And finally, make sure you check the carpus. You don't want to miss a carpal injury that's in association with, um, with uh, the distal radius fracture. Now this slide really just goes over some of the specific things, which we're going to talk about in more detail in the next few slides. Um, with regard to the volar plate, I really do want to make sure that my volar plate is abutting and fixating the volar ulnar fragment. Um, I want to make sure my plate's not too far distal, uh, cause irritation to the flexor tendons, and make sure my plate's not too proximal, and I'm going to miss fixation of the distal segment. 
Um, and then we're going to show you an example of what the EPL rupture can look like. That can be due to aberrant screw placement or to callus formation forming over that uh, first source uh, over the um, uh, Lister's tubercle. Now, with regards to intraoperative fracture reduction, let's say I've, I've got my exposure, I'm happy with my exposure, I need to get my fracture reduced. The first thing I like to do is make a saw bone. What I mean by that is I like to get as anatomic reduction as possible. For me to do that, I usually like to put, place a bump directly under the distal segment, and the weight of the hand, um, so I put a, put a bump under the distal segment here, it's usually two blue towels that are rolled up, and then the weight of the hand oftentimes extends the fragment. I'll usually have my assistant or someone try and hold the hand up and pushing it slightly volarly. That helps to give me the volar tilt uh, that I need. And then I like to put K wires. I usually will put two K wires from the radial styloid uh, into the uh, intact or proximal segment. And if I have a volar lunate facet fragment um, that is depressed, I'll elevate it. And I like to put a K wire going across. And if, if it's very distal, I'll even put it into the ulna temporarily to keep that fragment elevated. So you certainly can do that. Now this diagram over here is showing safe zones for pin placement. Uh, remember, um, you know, radially, uh, you do want to avoid the radial artery. You come uh, from proximal to distal, and that's fine. And you're in the intraoperative incision, you can be on the lunate facet fragment coming uh, volarly and or dorsally and, and be safe. So here's the, the volar, uh, K, here's the dorsal K wire here. You can actually come from this apex angle here as well, as long as your median nerve is out of the way. Now, this is a great article from JBJS 2004 discussing how loss of fixation of the volar lunate facet fragment um, can lead to carpal uh, subluxation or carpal dislocation. Now, here's a, here's a fracture, uh, which you can very clearly see here. There's overlap of the uh, scaphoid and the lunate over uh, the uh, dorsal and dorsal rim. When you look at a lateral x-ray, you can see this is a coronal shear type fracture pattern. The lunate facet fragment is traveling uh, volarly and distally with this lunate facet fragment. So it's very important then when you're doing uh, this volar approach and putting a plate along the volar cortex here and buttressing this fragment is to buttress this volar facet fragment. Now here's this, uh, here's the case where uh, probably the plate is placed a little bit too radially. And this is an older generation plate and these plates really didn't, weren't wide enough uh, for the segment. So here we're trying to get screw fixation into our a fractured radial styloid segment, and also some fracture fixation into a volar lunate facet fragment, but here we probably only have about one screw holding this together. If we look at the plate placement here, the plate placement distally looks very good. It's not too distal, it's not too proximal, and our screws aren't too long. So you may end up leaving the operating room here thinking that you've done a good job, but I would be very cautious because this is, a, this is the type of fracture where there's one point of screw fixation here, the carpus can start to translate again volarly and distally because we haven't done a great job uh, stabilizing that fragment. And if we look here, this is what's happened. This is five weeks post-op. This same patient has re-subluxed um, um, because her volarly facet fragment right here has displaced, and you can see I'm circling it right here. Everything else has stayed in, in place, but the volarly lunate facet fragment has pulled out, and the entire carpus has translated with it. So that's what we want to avoid. That's a probably uh, it's a very hard fracture to fix sometimes, but that's an easy fracture that we can we can prevent that complication by really focusing on that volar lunate facet fragment. Now here's just a, what what had to happen in that specific patient. Uh, that patient was revised to a more periarticular plate, which allows for more distal fixation. And not only that, it was felt to be so unstable. An external fixator was placed to really decrease the stress across that volar lunate facet fragment, allowing the fracture to heal. Uh, in an aligned position. Now again, the volar, lunate, um, the volar ulnar rim does extend distally, so it's very important to go as distal as possible. Um, and uh, beware of the volar marginal fragments. So those are the fragments that are really more avulsion fractures and the, and the volar and the, and the uh, radial ulnar radial lunate ligament is really attached to that, and it's, it's very hard to fix those. And sometimes your plate does need to be as distal as possible. Now, you know, we have, we have seen design changes in the plates over the past 10 years that have allowed for more screw uh, density into that volar lunate facet fragment, um, and that's made it much easier to treat these with just one plate. Um, you know, certain implant uh, companies have come up with 
uh, plates that are allowed to go uh, as distal as possible. These are juxtarticular plates. Um, and these, these are really good for these very distal marginal fractures. And um, we have plate designs now where they're really trying to buttress that volulinate facet fragment. And this plate design in particular, um, you can see that the, the lunar, the lunate aspect of the ulnar aspect of the plate really juts out and is trying to buttress that entire volulinate facet fragment. And it can capture all of these types of uh, fractures. Here's another special, uh, you know, sort of a specialty plate design allowing for very distal plate fixation. Now, let's talk a little bit about plate positioning. Now, in this uh, paper by Blazer et al., uh, they noted a higher frequency of flexor tendon ruptures with hardware extending volar to the volar, volar cortical margin. So what is a volar cortical margin? If I were to draw this red line, and this is the volar aspect of the distal radius, and this is that volar lip right here, that red line going tangential and parallel to the volar cortex, I'd like to have my plate proximal to that, okay? So this is probably a little bit too proximal over here. This is probably getting just a little bit too distal because it's uh, overlined that red line. This is very, very distal. You have to imagine that our flexor tendons are running right along here, and now they're kind of draped over our plate. So with constant irritation of those flexor tendons as you're, as you're uh, uh, doing physical therapy, those tendons can start to get uh, attrition, and then they can tear. So a lot of newer plate designs are a lot more low profile, so you can be very distal and they're very, very thin. So, uh, you know, you really, it's really important then to know the system that you're using. Now, Omri touched on this a little bit about some radiographic uh, x-rays um, and special intraoperative x-rays that you can take to really look and make sure that you don't have any screw penetration. We, you know, Omri was talking a little bit more about uh, kind of radiographic parameters for closed reduction, but those same views can be used. Um, something called the anatomic tilt view which is a PA tilt view and a lateral tilt view, has been shown to have great and uh, greater intra-observer reliability with sensitivity and specificity with being able to detect aberrant hardware placement, particularly screws placement. So um, over here, if we look at our, uh, this will be a lateral tilt view, here's a good lateral x-ray, okay? But what you cannot see, you cannot see down the joint line. Here, the ulna um, is obscuring uh, the, the uh, radial joint line. Not only that, remember, there is a 20-degree uh, inclination to the radius. In order for us to see down the radius, if you look down here, down the joint, we have to lift the, the uh, ulna and the radius about 20 degrees. Now we can look, very clearly see across uh, the radiocarpal joint, and we want to look and see if our screws are below this. This is a PA tilt view. Again, same thing here. We're accommodating for our 10 degrees of volar tilt. We need to raise the arm up about 10 to 11 degrees so we can look down the joint line and make sure our screws are not going across. And this is probably one of my favorite views to get. I, I do get this on every distal radius fracture that I plate volarly. Um, this is a, a dorsal tangential x-ray. And you can really see here when you um, bring the x-ray beam, which is shooting straight down here, you sort of bring the wrist almost uh, um, parallel to the beam, and then you have to flex your wrist out of the way, you can look along the dorsal cortex. And over here, you can see that the plate is placed on my volar surface, and I can see very clearly the dorsal cortex here, the most prominent point being the tubercle. And I can see if my screws have penetrated the dorsal cortex. If, I can't, if they are, then I can change them out at this point in the case. But not only that, I can also see into my, my sigmoid notch. I can see right here and make sure my screws have not entered and violated the DRUJ. And I, I really do like the view for that. All right, now, complications following internal fixation of unstable distal radius fractures with the Palmer locking plate. This was a great article published in 2007 in JOT. He looked at flexor and extensor tendon ruptures. And you can certainly get FPL and EPL ruptures. You can also get tenosynovitis. Those are things to be wary of. Um, here are some specific examples, and this is what it may look like. I'm looking here on the ulnar aspect of the distal radius, and there's a radial aspect. This is the an axial view on a CT scan. And you can see right here that I have screw penetration uh, through the dorsal cortex. Really, in no case should you really be going past the dorsal cortex uh, when you're putting in your distal screws. Um, you should, when you're drilling, first of all, try and drill up to the dorsal cortex. Uh, the screws only need to be about 75% across um, the dorsal across the distal radius. They don't need to be certainly getting bicortical fixation in this scenario. 
Um, and certain some people will use pegs. I don't use pegs. I like to use screws, but I leave my screws approximately four millimeters uh, short of the dorsal cortex. And then showing that, and this is where you, this is how you get an EPL rupture. And again, remember the triangle or roof-shaped component to the the distal radius, because your screws will not all be the same length necessarily. Now this is what it looks like if you get X-rays. Okay, so this is where very important to use oblique X-rays. The oblique X-rays can show uh, what it looks like if your screw is too long. In this scenario over here, it looks like your screws are not too long, but if you just oblique the X-ray, you can see that you've got a screw that's too long, and this is what it looks like if you go around the back. Um, even three, four millimeters of screw penetration is going to rub right along this tendon right here. And again, this is the roof analogy uh, of the, the distal radius, okay? Again, looking at what your x-ray beam looks like, okay, um, you're not going to be able to see it if you go right across here. Um, it's going to look like your screw is in. Um, what you need to do is you need to get that oblique view, and that oblique view will be tangential to the screw and show you the most prominent part of the screw right there. Get oblique views. This is what it looks like after, for an EPL uh, rupture after surgery, okay? On this side here, you can see the, um, the patient is able to extend uh, the thumb over here. The patient cannot. Okay, so be on the lookout for if that were to happen, you need to address that acutely. Okay, inadequate exposure is a problem, okay? If you have a very small incision like this, okay, you're not going to be able to look at both the bowl and the radial side like I talked about. You may accept this, but this is not acceptable. This is that um, kind of uh, radial translation that Omri was talking about. Now you've done it with a plate, and now you've created a source uh, of uh, aberrant callus formation on the radial side of the wrist, which can cause irritation to that first dorsal compartment. Okay, and this is what it looks like post-op, and again, this is what it looks like if you had to remove the plate. Again, um, this is, uh, other things have gone on here. There was screw loosening, but this is the reduction that you get, and you can get much better than this. Okay, so make sure you get appropriate plate exposure. This is what you can do. You can extend it, prox extend it proximally if you need to, and you can extend it distally across the distal wrist crease if you have to, um, and make sure you're not retracting too much on the median nerves or the radial artery. Always be on the lookout for concomitant carpal injury, okay? You want to make sure that you're not missing some sort of like SL ligament, such as this over here. Um, these can be addressed uh, at the time of surgery uh, with wire fixation. It does not need to be treated another time. Finally, post-operative pitfalls. Make sure you start hand therapy right away. Um, you know, typically after fixation, I'm confident in my fixation. Uh, I will put the patient in a post-operative volar plaster splint, but I will start finger range of motion immediately. I will start grip strengthening immediately. At two weeks when I take the stitches out, I'll transition the patient uh, to removal of wrist, ra uh, wrist brace. Um, and depending on, uh, you know, the patient's ability to follow instructions, I will start gentle uh, wrist strengthening, finger strengthening exercises at that time. Don't forget forearm rotation. That's extremely important. Um, you know, be on the lookout, uh, you know, for carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, you know, if patients uh, do not get good finger range of motion, they may need penalysis or capsule releases down the line. You can get a CT scan to add info if you need to. Thank you. All right, Sonny. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I see there's some questions. Uh, uh, Natalia asked about aberrant callus formation, limiting range of motion. You know, I haven't seen that in, in distal radius fractures that are fixed operatively because of the limited callus that forms and not in the um, not in the area that causes any loss of movement. Um, if anyone else wants to uh, say anything else about it. And, yeah, uh, I think for, for me, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Nadir, so for aberrant callus formation, I agree with you. There's really not much aberrant callus formation that forms. I, you know, when, I, when I'm mentioning that, I'm talking more just on the, if you have more of a malunion, if you're really not, uh, that distal fragment is uh, tr translated radially, um, when that heals, you just get more of like kind of like a bony defect. It's, and, and there's a little bit of maybe aberrant callus formation, but more is just malunion causing irritation. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, in terms of <clears throat> the carp carpal tunnel releases, um, there was a question about doing a separate incision, uh, which uh, I think it's okay to do a separate incision. Uh, this way you can just be away from that palmar cutaneous nerve. Uh, and if you extend that FCR incision, you just have to, to find it and protect it. And um, Dr. Should... Conner, yeah. Dr. Conner, how much emphasis do you put on a perfect reduction in a distal radius fracture that you think is an operative candidate anyway? Do you want it to see it as good as you can, or do you give up after one reduction and because you're going to take this patient to the operating room anyway? That's a great question, Philip. Uh, so, um, 
No, I mean, I think, uh, again, I think it, based on what Omri was saying, it depends on the patient. Um, there are certain patients, and I think doing at least uh, two reductions is reasonable. Um, there are some fractures where you know it's, it, that are operative candidates, like, for instance, volar shear fragments of the distal radius are very, very hard to keep reduced in an anatomic position or even an acceptable position, and they will translate over time. Those, I may give it one shot, but, I mean, I'm already talking to the patient about uh, the need for some sort of volar buttress plating. Um, but uh, I think it's reasonable to try. If you think a patient would benefit from closed reduction, I think it's benefit. It's, it's reasonable to try once, twice, you know. And, and also there was a question about SL ligament uh, injuries, and that's a tough thing to figure out. Uh, a lot of times uh, in the elderly, they may have a pre-existing SL ligament injury, and that kind of showed the case where uh, he had identified the SL ligament injury um, once the plate goes on. So, um, you know, I think uh, doing the stress test after the plate goes on is always a good idea and preoperative uh, x-rays of the other side. All right, I think uh, we're going to go on to our, our next talk, um, which is uh, going to be all about uh, dorsal plate fixation as well as uh, external fixation and K-wires. Dr. Tony McLaurin, who's the Chief of Orthopedics at Bellevue Hospital and Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery here at, at NYU. We'll, we'll load up uh, Dr. Thank McLaurin's you. Just, talk. Yeah, waiting for my slides to show up. I want to make sure my... Uh... You can hear my sound. Yeah, it sounds great. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was having some issues earlier, so now I just need some slides. And ex external fixation and K-wires is all I knew how to fix the radius with, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because you and I are old school, so we didn't, we didn't have that many options back in the day. All right. So um, this is sort of a little bit of a... Uh, hodgepodge here, but I just want to go over some more sort of basic information about what it is you need to be looking at to avoid complications. Um, really, this could be the slide for the talk. Choose wisely. You need the correct imaging, as we've discussed. You need to make the correct diagnosis. Pick the correct implant. Uh, correct fracture pattern for your chosen implant. There's a lot of options out there, and you've got to make sure you're picking the right one. And you need the correct technique. So I want to talk first about dorsal plating because those of you who've uh, been in the business for a million years like me know that generally when you would hear dorsal plating, um, you know, people would like gasp and, and uh, it was a terrible thing. And it was historically associated with really high rates of postoperative complications, specifically extensor, extensor tendon complications, irritations, synovitis, attritional wear, rupture of both EDC and EPL tendons. And then also the plates were relatively bulky, so you tended to have symptomatic hardware due to these plates. And then once volar plates came around, it really fell out of favor. I mean, when I was a resident, we were putting these things on like this nobody's business, and then, you know, we just sort of stopped using them. Um, and so they started to evolve as people uh, realized that they were problematic. So in the 90s, they started coming out with lower profile plates. They were a little thinner, and uh, as you can see in this one, uh, drawing right here that even the heads were a little bit recessed so that this I mean the hole was a little recessed so the screw head would go in it um, and then other types of plates that would take up a little less surface area but they still tended to be to have soft tissue complications and so uh, then in the late 90s and early 2000s people started moving more towards fragment specific fixation and this is based on the concept of there being five major fragments in the distal radius um, you've got your radial styloid fragment uh, right over here, also called the radial column, uh, the dorsal wall, which is depicted right there, an intraarticular fragment. So that's sort of if you're looking down on it from the top, you're going to see that fragment. Uh, the dorsal ulnar corner, something to really be aware of, and then the volar rim that we've already spoken about. And uh, you also need to be understand the three column concept that was also brought up a little bit initially, um, and just not to go over this too much, but with the radial column, uh, that gives you the length and alignment of your articular surface. The intermediate column is more responsible for that includes that die punch fragment that was mentioned earlier with the intraarticular, uh, and this is the primary load bearing column right here. So this is the thing that you really need to be cautious about. 
uh, restoring and making sure that it's okay. And the other thing is that that's the column that includes the uh, sigmoid notch and the DRUJ. So if there's an issue with this column, that's a huge problem. And then the medial column includes the distal ulnar TFCC radio ulnar ligaments, and that's uh, more the rotational column of the wrist. So using these concepts between the, uh, the fragment-specific type of concept and the three-column concept, uh, people started moving more towards this fragment-specific fixation. And so there's specific plates that are designed around the fragments and these three columns. And so if you notice this plate right here, so you start with this fracture over here, uh, and you've got this dorsal ulnar fragment here. And if you notice, this plate is actually going along the uh, intermediate column that I just discussed. And then coming out over here, over your dorsal ulnar fragment, there's a separate plate over there, over the radial styloid. And then here you are from the lateral view. So you see this screw sort of crossing, uh, going all the way across and catching that. And so there's a lot of different options with these. And here's just a couple of different ones. There's a little plate like shown on the x-ray. They have these little things here, which, um, you know, when they first came out and we derisively referred to basically as pins and paper clips. And you can uh, see these little things that you can uh, take this and put, put this little thing in your dorsal ulnar fragment is another way to fix that. And you can even put these way up under the articular surface and fix them in with screws. And so you see an x-ray that looks like uh, this one to the far right or this one below it. And you just see it looks like a bunch of little K wires and things in there. And so that was why we sort of came up with our derogatory terminology, but clearly these guys had a better idea of what was going on and what was appropriate than what we'd been doing with uh, dorsal plating before. The problem is this is still directly under the tendon. So it still may require removal for hardware irrita irritation, but certainly becomes much less of an issue than uh, you know the plates that I was using when I was a resident a million years ago. Um, just a couple of quick things about the approach. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but the main thing is you really want to make sure you're getting full thickness flaps. Um, you want to notice the superficial uh, radial nerve. It's crossing across distally here, uh, crossing your EPL. You want to identify it, elevate it up out of the way, and then protect it in these uh, full thickness flaps that you made. Uh, your EPL tendon is going to be elevated out uh, of its own uh, the third compartment there, and then retract it after you incise that. And it's really important to do subperiosal dissection of the second or the fourth compartment going this way. And then if you come in this direction, the second compartment as well. And you want to try to keep it subperiosteal because then when you put your hardware in and uh, close, your periosteum at least will be sort of a little bit of a barrier between the plate and, uh, and, the, uh, and the extensor tendon. Obviously, uh, you can't always do that based on the fracture pattern itself, but if you can have some sort of protection there, that's great. And then you don't want to put the EPL back into its anatomic position during closure because uh, that is a pretty good way to make sure that you're going to get a rupture. There's just not enough space in there anymore after the plate's there. So with the dorsal plating, it really, even though they've got much better implants for it, it's not something that you would use routinely, especially with the uh, advent of the volar locking plates. It's been shown that there are many fracture patterns that we used to think you could only treat with dorsal plating that are perfectly well managed with a volar locking plate. Uh, but it's important to remember everyone thinks, oh, these volar plates are great. And as Sunny mentioned, there's still significant complications associated with volar locking plates, including extensor tendon complications, which you sort of think are not going to happen. So don't think that, you know, dorsal plates are a terrible thing, but also that volar locking plates are the answer to all of your problems. Uh, but you do need to be able to recognize certain fracture patterns that will benefit from dorsal plating. And so it's going to be indicated in a dorsal shear type uh, dorsal Barton's fracture because volar plating in that is not going to do anything to keep your carpus from displacing dorsally. Also, if you have the die punch fractures, you've got to go there anyway to uh, find that articular fragment and get it elevated. And so, uh, and so that's why you want to be sure to go uh, dorsally for that. You really need to understand the three column and the fragment specific concept in order to use this so you, that you know, first of all, which implants are appropriate. You know, it's not so hard on the, on the volar surface. There's basically a plate that looks like it fits right there, but you have to be have a much better understanding of what you're using, uh, you know, with the dorsal plating. And also to know that the CT scan can be very helpful in identifying the fragments. 
Um, and here's just a couple of, uh, this will run just a axial cut here. And as you'll notice, as you get more towards the articular area here, and you can even see there's a nice impacted uh, cortical fragment sitting right in the middle of the articular surface. And then if we look on this uh, sagittal view here, which a lot of times is even much more helpful, or uh, sorry, this coronal here, and uh, now you really get a sense of there's your articular surface way down there, there's your siloid here, and so you get a much better understanding of what's going on here. And, and again, this is another thing, you know, along with the pins and paper clips, as a traumatologist, we used to sort of mock the hand guys about getting, uh, you know, getting these uh, CT scans for a distal radius fracture, but obviously it's something that's very helpful to you. So uh, moving on to looking at or avoiding complications with K-wires, again, this is something, you know, as uh, Dr. Exima mentioned that, you know, we were doing all the time and one of the few things that any of us knew how to do uh, well. Um, but uh, in this country, they're rarely used alone. There are some papers uh, reporting on just the use of them. If they're used alone, they really need to be done not in osteoporotic patients because they're not going to hold. But in really good bone that you're, uh, you know, you're choosing to fix this way, it is doable. Typically, though, people will use them as an adjunct to external fixation. The most common pin placement is actually not exactly what's shown here, but it's one or two pins through the radial styloid. And you want to make sure those pins are divergent because you don't want just two parallel pins. That's not really helpful to you. And then a pin from the dorsal surface through the dorsal ulnar fragment. And that can be kind of bothersome sometimes because you're working more on the volar surface and it can just be different. You know, the, that wire can get in your way when you're trying to pin it, especially if you're doing it sort of, uh, you know, provisionally as you're getting ready to do some fixation. You can also add a pin that's not shown here, but one that's going uh, transverse to the articular surface, uh, sort of more like this, to use it to sort of buttress up that articular surface. And I think Sonny showed a wire like that. And then if you need other pins to grasp other fragments, this one happened to have another dorsal fragment over here, and so this pin was placed there as well to hold that. So there's no uh, you know, specific number of pins you have to use. Obviously, you have to use at least two K wires because you need the rotational fixation or the rotational control, but you don't need to, uh, there's no fixed number that you're supposed to use. Um, in order to avoid complications, it's recommended, and I have to admit that I don't do this, but the recommendation is that you make small incisions and dissect down, especially with the styloid pins. If you take a look at this, uh, this, uh, anatomic drawing here, the superficial uh, branch of the radial nerve is right exactly the same place that you're stabbing your wires in. So it's probably not a bad idea to make an incision and kind of spread there. Um, you can also, if, you know, depending on how errant your wires go, you, you can uh, hit the first dorsal compartment tendons. The dorsal ulnar wire, it's easy to get into the fourth compartment. You want to kind of palpate it on the top of the wrist and, and uh, then feel yourself on the edge of that to put that in. And then you also want to not let the pins cross at the same level as being shown here. If you notice that the fracture itself is going right at across at about the same point, and then all of the pins are crossing at the same place too. So that really minimizes the stability that you have there with this construct. So ideally, you have one wire coming in like this, a second wire coming more divergent uh, in this orientation here, and then your dorsal ulnar wire coming, and they're going to cross in different places. And also, obviously, you don't want them to cross distal to the fracture. If it's an uh, injury where you're pin also finding the DRUJ to be unstable and you have to pin that, and you need to pin across the DRUJ into the radius, uh, it's recommended that you use a, a stiffer pin, like a 2.0 wire. Usually for these, you're using a 1.6 or the equivalent of a 0.062K wire. Uh, but for DRUJ pinning, you want a stouter wire so you don't have to worry about the wire breaking uh, between the two bones. As far as uh, pin tracks go, again, if you're just vigilant about releasing the skin around the pins when you place it, it helps to avoid pressure at the pin skin interface, which is what leads to pin tract infections. But even if you get them, they can usually be managed just with local, uh, you know, local wound care as well as oral antibiotics. Rarely do you have to actually take this hardware out. And then finally, looking at the X-Fix, it's really fallen out of favor uh, with improved internal fixation implants, but still does certainly have its place. Uh, indications include significant metaphyseal comminution. Like Dr. Kanda, I work in a trauma center. I get these people who, you know, fell three stories and landed on their outstretched wrist. So they're going to get a distal radius that looks like this on the right. 
there's so much metaphyseal comminution, you're going to have a really difficult time, one, holding those fragments of the plate, and two, maybe even getting it out to length. Also, if you have an injury where there's something going on, the soft tissues are just not amenable to incisions, like burns, degloving injuries, uh, then you also are going to be better off with an external fixator. And sometimes we'll just use it for temporary stabilization for polytrauma patients. Even if I'm thinking that I'm ultimately going to come back and fix this distal radius on the right, I might not get to it for a week or so, by which point everything is so contracted down, it's going to be nearly impossible for me to pull these soft tissues out to length. Uh, and so if I just uh, provisionally fix this with an X fix, then when I go to do my definitive fixation, everything is in a little bit better place. Uh, and so you also, it's important to understand the fixator that you're using. And one really key thing, and especially this fixator that is, that's shown right here is a good example of it. This is a tube that is only a specific length. Make sure you know exactly how much length you need before you put your radial pins in because what you don't want to do is put them in too proximally and then you actually run out of X fix. And remember, you're going to lengthen it. So that's a huge thing. Understand the X fix from that standpoint. Also understand the correct orientation of it so you don't end up having it so uh, palmer that it's blocking uh, some ex extension and abduction. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you really understand how it goes. Do not put the radial pins in percutaneously. Resist the urge. You feel that nice ridge on the edge right where the bare spot is you're like oh this will be fine remember also what runs right over that area is your uh, superficial radial nerve so it's ideal to avoid that so you want to make a full incision dissect down get the nerve out of the way put the pins in don't forget to close the wound before you build the x fix on top of it otherwise you're very sad when it comes to the end of the case um, and then you want to put your metacarpal pins uh, you put your first pin into the metadiaphyseal you re diaphyseal region here. And again, if you have a fixator like this where you have a clamp, the location of your second pin is fixed, but you want to make sure that this one is down in this area. Make sure they're both centered in the bone and are both bicortical, which is a lot harder to do than you think it ought to be. Um, you also want to try to get your reduction before you put the X fix on. You don't want to really rely too much on the uh, fixator for your length. There used to be this thing called the wrist jack and people would just put the wrist in all kinds of crazy positions to get their reduction. Ideally, you get it if you can hold it with K-wires before you even put the X-fix on, that's great. If not, you still want to make sure that you can kind of pull on it uh, manually to get the reduction without really cranking on the X-fix. And again, as with the K-wires, you want to make sure that you really release the, pin, the skin around all of the pins. Understand the fracture as well. Know what an X-fix won't work for. If you, it's difficult to maintain or obtain boulder tilt with an external fixture, if that's a big problem, this is probably not your implant. There's a high rate of loss of reduction with any boulder shear fractures, as you might anticipate. And you may need to have limited open approaches. Just because you're using an X fix doesn't mean that you can't make a small incision to tamp up some articular fragments and put some wires in it. And you also want to anticipate a high rate of pin tract infection and be sort of proactive. Some people advocate cutting the pins under the skin. Um, there's mixed uh, results in the literature about whether it makes a difference or not. Uh, one thing is that obviously if you cut under the skin, you have to go back to the OR. So uh, that's something to think about when you're doing that. And uh, also understand what ligament attacks will and will not give you. You're going to get a lot of length with this, but if you look here, there's an articular fragment down here inside the joint. No amount of pulling in the world is going to reduce that for you and need to keep that in mind when you're putting the X fix on. And the big thing is uh, avoid over distraction. Your radial carpal joint should not look like this. Your mid carpal joint should not look like that. Those are the people who have problems. You got to, you might need to do that initially to get it out to length, but then make sure that you release the tension and any excessive uh, palmar flexion or ulnar deviation in the X fix once you've got your reduction uh, done, because you don't want to maintain these these uh, rough positions. You want to make sure you can flex the MCP joints fully at, when you take the frame off. Otherwise, you've got too much tension on it. And all of that can lead to the dreaded CRPS, well-known complication reported up to 35% of the time. It's associated with over-distraction of the joint, excessive pal palmar flexion, and ulnar deviation. It can be managed with early aggressive multimodal treatment, including medication, uh, PT, and also remember psychotherapy as there is a component of that involved as well.
So all of these are less commonly used than they have been in the past. They all still have a role to play in the operative management of distal radius fractures, and they all have potential complications, but many or most of them are actually avoidable complications. So getting back to the first slide, the best way to avoid the complications with any of these, choose wisely. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. McLaurin. That was awesome. And uh, next, uh, we can put up Dr. Graham's uh, slides. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tom Graham, who's a professor of orthopedic surgery here at NYU and was former chair of the Curtis National Hand Center. He's going to be talking to us about avoiding soft tissue complications. Thank you, Dr. Paxima, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share the electronic podium with these luminaries. I've actually learned quite a bit tonight. Much of my talk is probably going to be admixed uh, with those uh, previous to mine because when we're talking about soft tissue injuries associated with fractures of the distal radius, it just kind of reminds us that this isn't all just about the x-rays. And so you have heard some of this tonight, but let's kind of go forward and, uh, and uh, do it. And why am I not able to advance? Having a little trouble advancing. So Dr. Graham, you should be able to click on those arrows at the bottom left, and once you click those, you can use your left and right arrow keys. Thought I was doing that. Uh, sorry, I'm clicking the, uh, they are empty. Well, somehow, did you do that or did I do that? Uh, I moved those, Dr. Graham. You should see at the bottom left here the green, where the green arrow is pointing, where the uh, arrows to progress and move the slides back are. Yeah, I'm hitting on it. Did I do that? I believe yeah, you did, Doctor. I did. Well, essentially, because we're already over time, let me try to just make a quick tour through this and touch on some of the variables contributing uh, to the complications. So, first of all, you know, how you got there, um, is one issue, the etiology and the mechanism, the timing, and then many are fixation related. Um, so when I say etiology, I really have to think about the, the magnitude of the initial trauma, obviously the, the usual suspects, whether this was an open or closed uh, injury. And then uh, we as surgeons certainly understand that there's morbidity associated with our interventions and the influence of what we choose, whether it's gonna be uh, the closed methods or, or open methods, many of which were nicely recounted and cataloged uh, earlier. I really uh, thought some of uh, the, the great recount of how we've evolved uh, in choosing our implants. Uh, we didn't go back as far as some of the pins and plaster maybe that uh, I wrote about back in the, in the 80s, but uh, how we took a tour through external fixation, which is very rarely used now, but was both uh, a benefit to our fracture treatment, could, but could uh, create a whole new set of potential complications in, uh, in, uh, regarding the soft tissues, and then some of the uh, more advanced plating techniques and some of the things that they've introduced with regard to that. And then the one thing we can't forget is distal radius fractures happening in that kind of bimodal distribution. So, you know, we're, we're seeing the high trauma, high uh, energy trauma, uh, that Dr. McLaurin described, and then of course we're seeing the more senescent population uh, that could be uh, having some medical comorbidities that are going to influence uh, the uh, problems that might uh, result. Uh, so, you know, obviously you can have direct mechanical trauma. It's an envelope uh, of soft tissue, and although we get a chance to observe the extent of osseous injury on x-rays, you have to appreciate that uh, there's a lot of energy that has been dissipated in the uh, tissues surrounding that, uh, which creates not only maybe the initial uh, trauma, but as time goes on, the swelling, edema, in the closed spaces of the carpal canal, possibly uh, the muscular envelopes of the forearm and hand are, are a big deal. Uh, we've seen really excellent demonstrations of uh, the problems with attrition of our moving structures over prominent hardware. And then, uh, of course, we have maybe some uh, other implant-related uh, irritations uh, or inflammations. And then we've spoken a little bit about infections, which, of course, uh, know no boundaries. You know, I, I think that 
yet, again, you have to take account who's sustaining these kind of injuries, and uh, you know, are they what are they bringing to the table with respect to their bone quality, uh, as well as their soft tissue qualities? What happens right at that uh, time of, of trauma? And then something that I started to realize as my time went on. What went on from the time of the original injury until you were seeing these individuals? Was there an attempt for a reduction? Was there a bunch of attempts that have gone on to probably create uh, even more irritation, bony fragments uh, that have been manipulated, et cetera? Has it been an excessive amount of uh, pressure phenomenon? What was about the splint application uh, in the first emergency room visit? So you know, you're inheriting something that has already had the uh, the touch of uh, possibly somebody else from the medical community, and often that is uh, very positive, but of course, it does have an influence, and you have to take that uh, into account. And then kind of the last uh, uh, couple here are related mostly to those that we treat uh, operatively, but uh, certainly there's so many factors that we go through intraoperatively with regard to tissue handling. The advocacy we've heard about making small mini incisions to see uh, longitudinal structures, especially nervous structures, uh, is a really sound one. Uh, I remember when we used to make uh, incisions and try to put our radial-based uh, external fixation uh, pins between the two radial wrist extensors, et cetera, which were obviously immobile, and so we felt that that was a really safe place uh, to put things at, at that time. So every step that uh, we uh, that we utilize to get fixation accomplished, especially if we're using many implants, i.e. multiple pins, uh, has to be uh, considered with regard to the corridor of their insertion and uh, what they might contact along the way. Uh, the casts are no stranger to causing problems. Uh, again, I think the use of any type of circumferential plaster in an early stage uh, injury is uh, something I would definitely advocate against. Uh, I think we all know that, but we certainly still see it regrettably. Uh, I think that uh, pins are a, a convenient and, uh, and very useful technique. We have to have them in our armamentarium. Uh, not everything has become an uh, indication uh, for plating, but we have to know how to use them. I mean, I, I think that imparting on to the new generation, really how to utilize pins, whether they're intrafocal pins like the Kapanji technique or transfracture pins, et cetera. Uh, it's been a long time since I considered uh, the trans DRUJ pin that we talked about. That's something we used to actually actually do a lot with a lot more frequency. But I think you have to know how to use them, but you also have to know the complication profile appertaining there too. And then I think that uh, the treatment uh, today of, uh, of all the different types of plating was uh, was very expert. So the the, another way to obviously look at these things is by tissue inventory. Most of these things have been discussed, and, and of course, it's everything from the outside to the inside, uh, and even multiple uh, problems. If you think about, uh, we can uh, be uh, when we're doing open reduction, especially. Uh, but you know, we used to almost just type, uh, kind of chalk up. Uh, a little bit of pin uh, tract infection is something that was just a cost of business. But there were many things we, we could do, not making sure that the skin was not under great tension, not quote unquote bunched up, making limited incisions, uh, et cetera. You know, there's just so many ways that we can be, be treating the skin, whether we uh, enter it through percutaneous means, mini open, or even more global approaches. And then I think that, you know, we talk a lot about nerves, but there are vessel uh, related problems. The, the dorsal branch uh, of the radial artery uh, and the anatomic snuff box is at some uh, potential peril when we're pinning from the radial side. Um, I think there's no doubt that it's a, it's a great concern uh, along with the dorsal, the dorsal sensory branches of the radial nerve. The tendons have gotten a lot of discussion today. We, uh, we get concerned about uh, uh, the, the uh, radial compartments, especially the, the first dorsal compartment, uh, but it's, it's potentially easy to, to get the third door compartment, the EPL, when we're pinning. And, of course, we all know about later complications of uh, potential EPL rupture. Uh, the ligaments of the cartilage is, gotta go, goes along with that. And I, when I say cartilage there, I'm really thinking about triangular fiber cartilage. Uh, it's all over the board. The percentage that's quoted about potential uh, triangular fiber cartilage 
injury of, of some discussion with uh, distal radius fracture. It's not something that probably presents in many of our cases, yet I think we always have to remember that we have to uh, evaluate the stability of the, D, uh, the DRUJ after we've fixed our distal radius fractures. Then, of course, some of these problems are, are so global uh, as to uh, be uh, consistent with some of those spectacular x-rays uh, we saw today. You know, when we used to see these little, we whether we thought they were tears or whether they thought they were inconsequential uh, direct injuries on the volar side, but just think at one time these distal radii are very displaced. And so uh, we've seen these ulnar-sided injuries, which in theory are open fractures, of course, and should be treated accordingly with respect to aggressive uh, washouts, et cetera. They may look quite innocuous, uh, but they're, they're, they're problems that certainly uh, herald maybe potential complications if not treated appropriately. Practically every longitudinal structure uh, is at concern, the, the, the favorites, of course, uh, being the median nerve and I think the radial nerve, but again, I've talked about the radial artery. The ulnar artery, of course, is fairly well padded and protected, not really a big deal. I threw in median artery just, in, just as kind of we've seen such uh, an array of potential problems over these many years. I think that probably one of the contributors to a couple of the evolving nerve deficits uh, that I saw with regard to that. Um, uh, probably related to that after I did the open carpal tunnel and saw very prominent uh, median arteries. Again, I think we know that the route that, that we're going to go in here uh, is important and where everything is. This is a sophisticated audience, really doesn't need much uh, on that. Uh, really, if I was going to say one thing I possibly could add that uh, we haven't talked about a, a great deal today is the global approach to the radius. I used to say the worse the radius fracture, the more likely I was to incorporate what I call the global approach and made videos of it uh, uh, that are on the Academy websites over the years that essentially incorporate a formal open carpal tunnel release with uh, an incision based on the radial aspect of the ring rag and likely crossing the volar wrist crease toward the ulnar aspect and then carrying up the uh, owner side of the wrist. This gave me kind of vista vision of uh, the, a bad distal radius. It allowed me to assess maybe the DRUJ a little bit better. I did not think I ever was limited greatly in reaching over all the way to the radial aspect. So as you see here, the kind of standard uh, uh, distal Henry uh, approach that we all use, but I just didn't think that the global approach really got its due. I always thought it was something good to have, have in one's armamentarium, uh, essentially coming down uh, between the ulnar neurovascular bundle and the profundi uh, that you could then use to uh, protect your median nerve as you uh, uh, retracted the uh, contents of the volar forearm toward the radial aspect. Um, well, we looks like we probably got a lot of the same things here uh, with regard to uh, little peaks here and there, looking for longitudinal structures here. You've almost seen maybe these same type, if not these exact same slides throughout the uh, course of the uh, evening, but it's never the wrong uh, answer to take the extra couple minutes and a very small amount of surgical morbidity to identify uh, the distal uh, branches of the dorsal radial nerve. Um, I, always, I looked for some of the more spectacular ones because I knew my colleagues would, would well cover some of these things. Kind of how, how, how we can have tendon-related injuries, whether a long-term or uh, from uh, attrition. Some people think ischemia, especially in, the, in a fairly uh, benign or not very displaced distal radius fracture. But for these terrible distal radius fractures, you can even have incarceration of the tendon. So if you have these uh, the rare situation, but you will have it during your career when you're trying to reduce a distal radius fracture and it has that springiness to it and it just simply won't reduce. Uh, we've gone in there and seen tendons that have been insinuated uh, in, the, in the fracture, but, uh, really just de describing uh, kind of the history of that where it was so displaced at one time that a tendon could become inculcated. Uh, uh, this I think came from my one of my favorite uh, fellows I trained, Steve Matchke. His article was described earlier how uh, they can kind of poke through. This one looks like it's in the third dorsal compartment. We've talked a lot about uh, that potential complication. Uh, 
I was never a huge fan of sub first torso compartment uh, plating, but there are certain fracture patterns that really invite it. Some think that maybe some of the larger uh, uh, radial styloid uh, type fractures that uh, can be buttressed that way. I just really think that it, it it's one of those things that I just had, I always had a little bit of a trepidation, but now that we can largely control some of the, uh, the radial styloid fractures through volar plating, I kind of feel a little bit better about that. But even when they look really good radiographically, these are still bulk, rather relatively bulky and obviously uh, in great intimacy uh, with the moving structures of the first torsal compartment. Uh, this was just the admonition about their placement, really watching out not to bring it around to, to molar, actually. Um, again, the, the triangular fiber cartilage injuries maybe are a little bit more difficult to diagnose. We certainly are used to uh, accepting a little bit of ulnar-sided uh, discomfort in patients with distal radius fractures. Maybe it's from a basi styloid type injury, and it's, and it's easy to see radiographically and test with the uh, resulting in DRUJ instability, but most of these are, are, are more covert. Uh, essentially, there's probably been an element of attenuation, maybe the distal, uh, the, uh, the dorsal and volar radial ulnar ligaments, or possibly uh, an injury to the articular disc. But these are things we probably kind of follow along early, but later on uh, can be issues. And I always try to tell my uh, patients that it it's, was a zone of injury. These were transverse uh, forces that went typically from the radial side to the ulnar, sometimes creating a visible injury to, to uh, the ulna, but often the soft tissues in that area could have been uh, injured, but not uh, uh, so easily seen. And I don't, we don't really, we don't uh, just simply get uh, cross-sectional imaging like MRI early in many of these fractures, but be prepared to, to describe early and, and treat late. Uh, but it's always good that you've had uh, that in your notes that you told the patients there might be ulnar sided soft tissue injury that uh, was not something we got to see. Um, when we're talking about the ligaments, we obviously, do, uh, we've already covered the uh, intrinsic ligaments, especially that of the, scapho, uh, the scapholunate ligament. But, you know, you have a lot of other things going on there. You can have uh, LT ligament injuries. You can have uh, uh, the type of injuries that go through the radiocarpal joint that can detach the radioscapocapitate and long radiolunate ligaments leading to a radiocarpal uh, translation or subluxation. These are all well documented and I think they've actually been well gone over today, mostly by my colleagues. Uh, here's just some, you know, kind of spectacular injuries, including perilunar uh, problems that can be associated, of course, with distal radius. Just reminds us, uh, of course, of the amount of force that is sometimes dissipated in some of these. Uh, sometimes the distal radius fracture uh, around the radial styloid can look relatively benign, maybe in an AP, but you're surprised to see in the lateral that there's translation of the corpus. And that's often associated with these larger fragment distal radius, or excuse me, uh, radial styloid fractures that again are the anchor for the radioscapocapitate and long radial lunate. Uh, and they can translate with the corpus, is what I described a long time ago in an article about uh, transverse instabilities of, of the wrist associated with distal radius as the large fragment fractures or the inferior arc. I think the, the more insidious ones are when very small flakes, if you will, of the volar lip of the radius uh, have been detached. Uh, and, but you, and you see that and you don't think it's uh, that the swelling you're seeing and the pain the patient's experiencing should be uh, associated with such small bony injury, when in reality this was probably a, a relatively catastrophic radiocarpal dislocation uh, that has maybe just the markers or the herald of uh, the type of injury it was by manifesting those very small volar lip fragments. Those small fragment fractures like that on the right, I think, are some of the most uh, ominous type of fractures that uh, we see. Here's an evidence of, of the one that, if you only got one view and you looked at the, at the uh, PA or, uh, view and you saw that radial styloid fracture, you'd say, yeah, that's probably not a big deal. Maybe, you know, leave it be, maybe put a pin in it or terminally threaded cancella screw, but look at the lateral. I just think it's fascinating if you think about the forces that uh, are at work here. And so the carpus was completely subluxated because that uh, essentially fragment was, uh, with its uh, extrinsic ligaments 
attached to then the carpus was really acting as one unit. Here's the small fragment fractures. I always said beware the two styloid fracture. When you have a significant radial styloid fracture and a significant ulnar styloid fracture, you can imagine there is a significant amount of force traversing the wrist. Uh, again, when you fall on your outstretched hand with dorsiflexion, uh, ulnar deviation, and intercarpal supination, you gather a lot of force on the radial aspect and it has to go somewhere. Often it does go through the carpus, resulting in the greater and lesser arc type patterns, but sometimes it does skim, if you will, across the radiocarpal joint, creating a, the ultimate injury, which is essentially a form of radiocarpal dislocation and the soft tissue injuries applicating there too. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the problems. Uh, again, I throw in uh, the, what we used to call RSD, or the sympathetically mediated pain dysfunction syndrome, it's now called CRPS, and just basic stiffness, whether it's associated with a sympathetically mediated uh, dysfunction or not. Stiffness is a soft tissue complication. And uh, again, we're fighting it almost all the time. It, I always find it fascinating. Injuries that we're always worried about their stability early, we're usually worried about hyperstability late or stiffness. And so we, that, why we uh, are, are getting more adept and aggressive at uh, fixation is to not only restore anatomy, but to, to introduce uh, possibilities of earlier motion. And uh, it's just, I think, one of the most important things we do, uh, that being the association we have with our occupational or sometimes physical therapists. You know, it's easy to focus on the bone. It's easy to see. It's easy to understand. You know, we've all grown up with the concepts of skeletal fixation. But, but I think that it's a great time to bring out our biomechanics and think really about the force transmission that not only affected the bone, but touched all the soft tissues around it. And then you kind of go, I just, like I said, take an inventory. Uh, what potential uh, pathology and dysfunction could be introduced uh, by all the all the energy that happened earlier, the treatments that we actually go 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 about. Uh, I think the approaches I think are really where it comes down to. I I love the fact that we've talked so openly about some of the challenges we all have with that. The fact that uh, questions have come whether it's okay to do one or two uh, uh, incisions. I have no problem doing a second incision for a limited carpal tunnel release if I do the distal and rear approach. But again, I, I would admonish you to at least think about, go to a lab, go to a textbook, and learn that global approach, because there's going to be a time you're going to need it. And you feel so much better having released the carpal canal, maybe having inspected uh, the contents of Guillaume's canal, but uh, treated the fracture uh, and uh, taken care of uh, the limited releases. And just remember, it's not over when the bone's fixed. It's easy to pat oneself on the back because our report card has typically been x-rays. But really, that's, real, that's often when the problem really starts for the soft tissue. And again, we're combating concepts like evolving uh, pressure phenomenon uh, early and later just generalized stiffness because of the trauma that was introduced or we introduced with our treatment. I appreciate the opportunity to be the anchor person uh, on this, and I congratulate my colleagues and thank everybody who took their valuable time tonight. Thank you, Tom. And uh, there are no further questions. I want to thank uh, the four speakers, Tony McLaurin, Omri Alion, um, Sonny Conda, and uh, Tom Graham for these outstanding presentations. I think we all learned something about the distal radius today, and um, we will hopefully use it in our clinical practice in the future. Uh, thank you again for Blue Sky for hosting this webinar uh, with us, and I hope to uh, see and hear everyone again soon at another webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And on behalf of the NYU School of Medicine, I would like to thank you all for your participation in today's event. Uh, please feel free to download the course presentation in your handout section. You will now be redirected to the CME login page. Please log in and take a moment to complete the appropriate course evaluation and attest to your credentials, or credits rather, to obtain your certificate. This concludes today's program. Thank you all, and have a great day.